Hello, fellow truthers. I'm David Ravel, and this is Value Sign for Tuesday, February 15. For all of our articles and podcasts, visit valuesign.com. Well, today, Justin Trudeau, the imperious son, just ahead. Well, on April 17, 1982, then-Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau signed into law, along with Queen Elizabeth, the Canadian Charter of Rights. Considered the Canadian equivalent of the United States Bill of Rights, the charge granted to every Canadian citizen certain fundamental democratic rights. Among these were the right to life, liberty, and personal security, the right to live and work anywhere within Canada's borders. And most critically for our discussion today, the right to peacefully assemble. Yesterday, one Justin Pierre James Trudeau, the current Prime Minister of Canada, took the first step in negating that right of peaceful assembly. By initiating the Emergency Powers Act, Trudeau the Younger and the son of Pierre Elliott Trudeau has indicated his willingness to break by whatever force needed, the peaceful assembly of the Canadian truckers, who, as you know, have for the past couple of weeks paraded a convoy across Canada, which convoy is now parked in the capital city of Ottawa, as well as several border crossings with the United States. As demonstrations go, this one is certainly orderly and most definitely peaceful, in marked contrast to the recent demonstrations that we have endured here in the U.S., where such groups as Antifa and Black Lives Matter have staged violent riots within several American cities over the past year or so. When left to their own, the Canadian truckers have been entirely well-behaved, as have the thousands of their supporters who have greeted them at every intersection and overpass on their drive to Ottawa. Now, it's an open question whether these assemblies can remain peaceful after the Emergency Act is now put in place. No doubt troops will be sent in. Now, on a very positive note, just hours ago, the Ambassador Bridge linking Canada to Detroit was reopened after negotiations between Canadian authorities and the truckers were concluded successfully. But to give you some idea of how closely aligned our two countries are, Consider this. That one bridge carries over 40,000 commuters daily, many, if not most, to jobs across the border, while also on a daily basis, nearly $325 million worth of goods cross that same bridge. So important is this Canadian source of parts and components that U.S. automakers were closing plants when it was announced that the bridge was also closing. Americans simply did not have the parts needed to build their new cars. Now, the truckers, after all, are a vital cog in the supply chain, and without them, our already fragile economy would get even worse, no doubt threatening to fall into recession. That's what makes the reaction by both Ottawa and Washington all the more puzzling. So far, there have been two reactions by our nation's leaders. First, President Joe Biden admonished the Canadian Prime Minister to, quote, get tough with the demonstrators. And now, the second reaction, when Trudeau himself threatens the truckers with armed response. What's happened to our two countries, countries which are supposed to be among the leading democracies in the world? Why has there been absolutely no effort to talk to the truckers, to negotiate, to find out the full scope of their grievances? Conflicts are not unusual in modern democracies. In fact, we could say that they're part of our way of life. Two parties often get locked in major disagreements. Recently, there was the 1994 baseball strike, or the 1997 strike by workers at United Parcel Service. In Canada, there was the 2007 railway workers' strike, or my personal favorite, the 1902 coal workers' strike, primarily here in Pennsylvania, 
The strike was settled when then-President Theodore Roosevelt invited all the parties to come to Washington, sit down, and hash out their disagreements with him. And the theme in all of this is the same. Bring these parties together, sit down, discuss the differences. But that's not happening today. In fact, it's apparently not even suggested. And why not? It's because the imperiousness, coming from both Ottawa and, I might add, from Washington, flows from such things as mandates, executive orders, emergency orders. It's most undemocratic. And I can't help but wonder what Trudeau the Elder would think of his son today. Now, in economic news overnight, Japan has reported that their economy rebounded from last quarter's slump. Japanese GDP rose at better than 1% for the fourth quarter versus a decline for the quarter before. The European Union also reported solid GDP growth coming in at 4.6% on their second estimate for the fourth quarter. That's one of the better GDP numbers anywhere. Moving here to the U.S., it's again inflation front and center. Wall Street expects that we will report a producer price index to once again go higher, with prices at the producer level estimated to rise by 9.7% on an annual basis. Now, producer prices usually take a month or two to be reflected at the retail level, so we're likely looking at even higher prices come this spring. It's a very big day in earnings reports, with over a 100 companies on the calendar. Heading the list will be Airbnb, then hotel company Marriott International, Devon Energy, and entertainment company Viacom. Check the listings for your favorite stock. And that's Value Side for Tuesday, February 15. For all of our podcasts and blog posts, visit valueside.com. I'm David Ravel. ValueSide is independently written and researched. The views expressed are strictly my own. Mm-hmm.